Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Luke Vibranchik and today we have a very special guest. It's the one and only Graham Oppie, Professor Graham Oppie. Hello. Hi. The philosophically savvy people will um, most likely already know who Graham is, uh, but if you don't, um, Graham um, is a philosopher of religion. He has a PhD in, uh, in, in philosophy. Uh, he teaches at Monash University in Australia. Uh, and um, he has debated many theists over the years, such as William Lane Craig, Andrew Loke, uh, Ed Fazer, Josh Rasmussen. Uh, and he, he has written many books on the subject of philosophy of religion, uh, all of which I recommend, to be honest. I've read uh, a few of them, and uh, they always uh, left me satisfied. Yeah, maybe before we begin, I'll also tell you that um, your book, uh, Arguing About Gods, had a very significant of effect on me, and uh, it's a part of my life, to, uh, to be honest. Uh, it was my sort of entry ticket to, to serious thinking about philosophy of religion, so I want to thank you for that. Wow. Wow, it's nice to hear that somebody's ready. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, yeah, and before we begin, I also would like to um, point out that um, this will also be available, this recording will also be available uh, on Spotify, iTunes, and Google Podcasts. Okay, let's get to our subjects. Uh, so, um, Professor Graham, uh, you are a naturalist. Am I getting this right? Yes. So, uh, what I think is that um, there are only natural causes, I and mean, that would be the best way to describe what I think is the key to naturalism. Mm -hmm. And I think that the best guide that we have and that we're ever likely to have to figuring out what the natural causes are is science. Of course, the, the sciences are a fallible guide, but they're the best guide that we've got. And so the causes that are taken seriously in science are the causes we should take seriously when we come to do philosophy. As far as I understand, your approach is that the naturalist is also entitled, if he or she pleases, to believe in uh, non-causal uh, entities. Is that correct? Right. So lots of philosophers have thought that they're apart from the causal domain mm -hmm. there's a domain of abstract objects that might include all kinds of things numbers properties propositions there's all kinds of things that might be in there and it's not a disqualification from naturalism the way that mm -hmm. i use the word that you believe in those things i try to avoid them all for other reasons but um mm -hmm. But that's, I regard that as an in-house debate amongst naturalists, whether there are abs abstract objects, and if there are abstract objects, what abstract mm, objects mm. there are. Right. Yeah. It seems to me that many of the naturalists, especially the, um, the ones which don't deal heavily with philosophy, they it sort of are afraid of, of allowing anything as queer or maybe anything as uh, strange into their ontology as, for example, uh, numbers as something uh, external to their own thoughts and so on, right? Right. So I'm not afraid of doing that. It's just <laughs> I prefer not to because um, mm -hmm. you, one of the theoretical drives is to make your theory as simple as you can, and it'll be simpler if you don't have numbers as objects, for example, in the theory. But then you need some story to tell about mathematics, and if you think there are mathematical truths, as most people do, how there can be mathematical truths in the absence of numbers and um, right. functions and all the other stuff that you talk about in mathematics. I, it's not that I think that's impossible. In fact, my favourite view will be one of those views. I'm not, mm -hmm. I would rather not be a mathematical Platonist, but I think that um, people who have been... Math there, there are plenty of people who were naturalists when it came to causation who mm -hmm. thought you can't do without supposing that there are numbers. And mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. you've got to add them in. It's just that that's kind of irrelevant to the debate about right. um, whether there are non-natural causes. The same seems to me uh, to apply to the realm of meta-ethics and, for example, what we uh, decide that the, mm, for, for example, normative facts are. And I would like to ask you about that. So, for example, people like Peter Singer, he used to mm, maintain, well, he was an anti-realist and he switched over to more realism and now is calling himself a Mm, non-naturalist when it comes to uh, ethical facts and normative facts. And do you think uh, this could... Mm, I, I was thinking if the normative facts mm, 
are causal or not, and in, in, in the sense that um, maybe they oblige us to do something, they, they sort of tell us to do something in a, cer a certain sense. Do you think that Peter can still call himself a naturalist? I think he could still call himself a naturalist, but there is a question about um, the understanding of causation, because if you think of causal talk as all kinds of explanatory talk, um, the way that, say, Aristotle did, so he thought there were formal causes and final mm -hmm. causes right. and so on, whereas I'm thinking there's just efficient causation. There's really just one kind of cause. Mm. And the way that I think about it, it in what it actually does, it involves transfer of conserved quantities, right? So um, if you think that there's a causal exchange between two things, it's because they're exchanging, I don't know, angular momentum or momentum mm. or um, charge or there's a whole lot of things that could be in there, right? And that, however you, you think about the normative, there's not normative stuff that's exchanging conserved quantities with the physical stuff mm. or the chemical stuff or the biological <laughs> yeah. stuff or whatever. I would imagine uh, so. And maybe let me just ask you an additional question about that. So, um, for example, the material cause, according to Aristotle, would be just the substances which make up the, a, a given, so yeah. let's say that we see a statue, right? So the sort of the, the stone it's made out of is the yeah. material cause. How do you treat that sort of stuff? Do you deny altogether that, or maybe do you prefer not to even call it a cause, but just simply? Yeah, I a wouldn't call it a cause, right? That's. Right. I know, I'm thinking that there's various kinds of explanation, and so you can have. Um, kind of structural explanations. Those are mm -hmm. not causal explanations. It's not a matter of cause and effect. You know, the way that I'm thinking about cause and effect is something else. So, I mean, to t use an example that one of my Australian colleagues uses, if you've got a mm -hmm. uniform, uh, sorry, a continuous distribution on a sphere of something, say temperature over a sphere, there'll be at least one pair of antipodal points that are at the same temperature. This is just the theorem of mathematics. So mm -hmm. it's going to be true of the Earth, right? At any time, there'll be at least one pair of points on opposite sides of the Earth that are at the same temperature. Now, there's not, you, you don't need a cause for that. It's mm -hmm. a structural explanation if it's near enough to true that the temperature distribution is continuous over the surface of the Earth and it's near enough to true that the Earth's a sphere, then you're going to get that out as a consequence and so you can explain it, but it's not giving a causal explanation. You're not saying earlier conditions were thus and so and the laws of nature are thus and so and together that explains, right? That's just not the right way to explain it. Mm. I'd like to, maybe this is an annoying question, but uh, I think it's worth discussing that. So when it comes to explaining what naturalism is in, is in terms of a natural entity, right? One could uh, yeah. sort of allege that this is just kicking the can down the road and really you should get to, you should explain what the natural entity, what's that supposed to be, right? So I've seen different approaches to that question. I've seen people just say that, well, um, there are, here's a few examples of a natural thing, right? This table is natural, this microphone is natural, uh, this shirt is natural, and so on. But maybe, well, th these are just a few examples, and I'm wondering whether we should even attempt to define what that is supposed to be. I mean, we need some sort of distinguishing factor, or maybe we need to just not not sure what is the right approach here, so maybe I'll just pose it to you. What's, what is a natural entity? Right. So sometimes the way that I do this is you want you want to have a contrast class as well. So if there were perhaps terms possible, but if there were these other kinds of things, they wouldn't be natural and contrast them with the things that are natural. And then you've got two lists. If you give people a bunch of of, of names of things and say sort them, they all sort them the same way. So it makes it look as though you don't really need a definition. It looks as though people's capacity to sort these mm -hmm. things um, is really latching onto something, a, a kind of mm -hmm. real distinction. So well, maybe that's I... that's, but that might not be right. Um, I think it is. I mean, I mean, one of the things to say in response to people who want definitions is that the whole kind of analytic project of 20th century philosophy, defining mm -hmm. things like knowledge and causation and works of art and so on, 
was very unhappy. Nobody ever came up with an acceptable definition of anything. <laughs> and so why should why should natural be any different? Um, there is a there's another thing to say. Well, there's at least two more things to say. Mm -hmm. um, one is that, uh, in a way, the way that we think about the natural has an origin in our history when, at least in the West, um, Christian thinkers thought of the natural world as kind of part, but not all of the domain that God made, that God created. Mm -hmm. so, right. there, so in the beginning, we're thinking there's just God and God makes perhaps some other domains with other creatures in it. There might be angels and so on that um, actually yes. part of the natural universe. But he makes the natural universe. And the way that naturalists think about it, about it is that's all there is. That's the one bit, the natural universe. <laughs> yes. And if the theists don't know what you mean by the natural universe, then their own picture has just become incoherent, right? They, mm. They've got no mm. explanation of something that's central to their view. So right, right. it doesn't seem to me like there's a particularly – that there genuinely is a particularly pressing issue here. We kind of – everybody knows what we mean, more or less, by the natural universe. Right, right. Uh, on both sides of the debate. It strikes me as correct, as you say, that if we give somebody a list of objects and tell them, you know, and it contains angels, uh, demons, uh, a cup, right, a, a teacup, uh, or a, a computer monitor, they'll be able to actually sort them. Uh, this, but uh, I think this might be uh, getting clear. So, for example, uh, the Paul of Tarsus, right? The, one of the authors of uh, letters in the New Testament. Um, there's, there's this New Testament scholar called uh, Dale Martin. He says that uh, Paul actually imagined that the spirit, the pneuma, uh, was a natural substance. And it, was a, uh, and it was a very refined and sort of thin substance. But uh, I, I, I suggest that Maybe uh, this sort of stuff is just clarified by natural science, right? So we go uh, to science and we then ask, yeah. what, and it did, for example, the pneuma was responsible for, for uh, the breath, right? So it, 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 hence the sort of association of the spirit and, and the sort of whew, uh, that yeah. we give out of our mouth. But uh, this is just clarified and then refuted by, well, in a certain sense, by natural science. Uh, do you think that's, that's right, more or less? Yeah, so I said at the beginning that, you know, when you want to know what the, the causal stuff, what causal stuff there is, what you refer to is the natural sciences. And if you think that there are um, sort of generic, I'm oh, sorry, there are, there are causes that you can only see at the social level and the social sciences as well, right? But um, that's your guide, if you're a naturalist, to what the causes are, and the the pneuma is not going to get in there, right? Mm. Because there's no there's no science that postulates it, no science, no psychology doesn't see any need for it, or neuroscience, or you know anything right. that might be a relevant science. When reading your uh, naturalism and religion, uh, the book you wrote. Um, I found myself pretty much agreeing all the time, but uh, there's one sentence that uh, I found <laughs> that maybe uh, I thought it was controversial. Uh, uh, so maybe I'll just uh, pose it to you or read that, the sentence and then say uh, what I have in mind. So um, you wrote that no future science is going to tell us and ideal science would not tell us that there are ancestors, spirits, demons, devas, ghosts. Uh, and, of course, uh, I'm convinced that these are non-existent entities. <laughs> uh, I'm not yeah. that superstitious. But these entities are described in a certain way in the legends and myths. And often they actually interact with the physical world. I mean, in the sense that they move things, they grab people, they lift them up, maybe, which looks to us like levitation, right? Uh, so my thought was that maybe if uh, they did exist, right? Uh, which I don't believe in, but if they did, then we could actually detect it through the scientific method. Uh, is that correct or wrong? There's something tricky about this because, on my view, it's not just that there aren't these things, but there couldn't be. Mm. And you, it's a sort of a posteriori necessity. I mean, science rules them out, but what there could be is basically determined by what's actual. 
right? So mm. I have a, have a, I favour a kind of a kind of branching world view of possible worlds where they all share some common part with the actual world and branch off from it, right? If the if there could be, um, you know, ancestor spirits, then I think there would be right? <laughs> we're part of the actual world. Mm-hmm. Um, that's roughly it. So you, the, the more being a bit more careful about it. Science isn't just telling us what the actual world's like; it's telling us what any possible world could be like. Hmm. Is what I think. maybe. So I'm thinking mm-hmm. the laws are necessary. The initial mm-hmm. conditions are less are necessary. You're not going to get. It's not just that you aren't going to get um, Davis or um, ancestor spirits or whatever. You just couldn't. Right. Um, so now that's very controversial because it relies on controversial views about. Modality. Um, modality. And you don't have to be a naturalist, I think, to accept the story that I just told. And so, however, the kind of naturalism that I like the most is going to tell that story. You could think that um, there's contingency about the laws. You could think that there's contingency about the initial conditions. If you think that there's contingency about the laws, you might think that if the laws were sufficiently different, it would have permitted interaction between Numa and a physical body, for example, or something like that. So I'm not thinking that these views are ruled out a priori, but I think that they're kind of impossible a posteriori on the mm. kind of naturalism that I like the most. So it doesn't, if somebody has one of these views, I'm not committed to saying that they're being silly or irrational or something in holding the view. It's just that we've got very different ways of thinking about. Um, what's metaphysically possible. To clarify this point, because I think this has the potential of of bringing us to some misunderstanding. So it's not like uh, the, 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 when you say that it couldn't be, you don't mean, for example, a logical possibility, that it's a contradiction to suppose that there is a ghost, right? No, it's definitely not a, a, a logical contradiction. Um, it's... It's rather, as I've said before, that I have a view about how we should think about what's ontologically or metaphysically possible. And I think that we should ground those modalities in the actual world. And because I think that the laws and the initial conditions are necessary, that means that you get a very kind of constricted range of what's ontologically or metaphysically possible. It doesn't mean that someone couldn't reasonably have a very different theory, including a very different theory of modality, on which they thought that there actually are ghosts, for Mm. example. It's just, (laughs) that's not my view. And I don't have to say they're irrational in order to say that um, they're getting things wrong. Your approach to the uh, question of how to, um, of of how the outcome comes out, how how it comes out, which big big picture, right, as you call it, is the one we should favour, looks a bit different than uh, what your standard atheist or naturalist would say, because, for example, you say that there really isn't any evidence um, or data which favours naturalism over theism. Is that correct? So there's no... What's the word? There's no kind of key piece of evidence that decides the case. Mm. What I think you have to do is you have to think about all of the data that people think is relevant, and then you have to think about the total theories that they construct, and then Mm -hmm. you have to think about the virtues of those total theories. And my view is naturalism is a simpler theory, so that's kind of win on one side. And there's nothing nothing in the data that you can explain better using some view other than naturalism. So that makes naturalism the best view, Mm. better than all the non-naturalistic ones. Mm. And... That's there's a series of judgments that go into that that are all controversial, and you know there are theists who push back against different parts of it. But that's what I'm going to say. That's what justifies naturalism. It makes the best trade-off between being as simple as possible and explaining as much as possible. You can't hmm. get a better view than it. But it's not there's not some smoking gun or some central piece of evidence, which is the thing that you're going to point to and say, see, see, Theus, there's this bit of evidence and you can't explain it and I can. And that's Mm. why uh, it doesn't, I don't think it works like that. Maybe to pick up this point, so mm, by theists, you now mean something like the best 
best theist we can imagine or the best hypothesis of theism we can imagine, right? Yeah. But my idea is you should compare the best versions of the two theories. So you should build the best naturalistic theory and the best theistic theory that you can, and then you should compare them. And if it turns out that um, th that you haven't done as well as you could, someone else might come and build a slightly better theory, but you keep building the best theories on both sides. And you... Mm -hmm when to the best of your ability you've considered the best theories if you've come down on one side then you think at least for now that's where i'm sitting in my estimation it is sometimes rational to uh, focus on the evidence when for example we are facing a theist of a specific with a specific set of beliefs in his big picture. So, for example, the young Earth creationist who is a Southern Baptist who thinks that, you know, this is getting back to a point that Gregory Dawes once made, that it might be unfalsifiable. The, the, the theory of theism might be unfalsifiable, but the theory of yeah. theism which postulates that God created the world 6,321 years ago on the 23rd of yeah. March, just in the evening, right? That might be falsifiable. And then we might, you might want to focus on the evidence because, as I would suggest, mm, this is straightforwardly refuted by science. Would that be the right approach or the wrong approach? Well, I think it can fit into my methodology too because you compare, just compare that version of theism with one that's more like William Lane Craig's and so it accepts that the universe is roughly whatever it is, 13.82 billion years old or whatever. Yeah. Um, and then you think about what's going to have to be explained here. You've got to explain, part, part of what the data is, is that all the scientists say that the universe is 13.82 billion years old. And here's you saying that it's 6,000 years old. How do you explain, mm. make sense of the scientific consensus? There's a, there's a big explanatory job there that you just, it's going to be very hard for you to discharge. And whatever you postulate, whatever kind of bizarre conspiracy theory you come up with to explain what's going on there, it's going to make your theory worse. So <laughs> it's not going to, it's not going to, that kind of theistic theory just isn't going to be a best kind when you're thinking about putting the, mm. um, the best theistic theory up against the, the best naturalistic theory. It won't be in the running. That's what, right. that's what I would say. So um, it's not, I mean, you might say it's kind of crippled by that fact, but it's not that fact alone. There'll be a bunch of other stuff in that kind of theory as well. And the combined weight of all of the problems is going to make it much worse than some other theistic theories that you might be, um, that, that would be better things to compare naturalism with. I'd like to ask you if there's any, uh, anything you can imagine, for example, that will, you know, appear tomorrow or just, uh, you know, in a few hours that, would, that you would con consider to be better explained by certain sorts of theism or maybe just theism in general than on naturalism. Because uh, to me, it seems that there are uh, just numerous such examples. Uh, how do you uh, look at that sort yeah. of... So there's a part of Hume where he talks about the voice from the sky. Mm -hmm. You know, it speaks to darkness. everybody in a language that they can understand and it tells That's them right. all these things that they didn't know were true, but they can now confirm are true and so on. And um, the, if, if, if you try to imagine being in this circumstance, it's very hard to know what you would think. But, mm. the, but a more important question is going to be, so for you right now, how likely is it that you're going to be met with a scenario like that <laughs> at any point in the future? <laughs> to which I think the answer is zero. Right, there's just no chance that that's going to happen. So I'm not sure what mileage we're going to get out of. Right, you can you can tell um, interesting fictions about all kinds of impossible, inconsistent scenarios, but you shouldn't draw any conclusions about what you ought to believe about reality from those kinds mm. of fictions. Mm. Right, um, and it, it is an interesting question if you start hearing voices. Mm -hmm. right? Divine voices, you know, God's telling you to go and sacrifice your, your oldest on a bonfire <laughs> in the backyard. Exactly what you should do. 
Right, right. Well, maybe, That's even maybe a problem I'm being, for theists. I'm, I'm being unfair in that case, <laughs> right? But it depends what the voice is telling you. Right? Mm. Yeah, but we can spice it up by saying, for example, that um, everyone is hearing them. That, then it gets a sort of scientific yeah. uh, aspect to yeah, it in the sure. sense that it's inter, intersubjective, right? Right, and so that's why in Hume's example, everybody can hear it in their own language, right? So there's right. this voice, mm. and it's just one voice speaking from the sky, but it sounds different to everybody who hears it, depending upon, I don't, don't quite know how it works if you're, you know, you're kind of e equally versed in half a dozen languages, <laughs> just arbitrarily picks one, but anyway, you, right. know, you get... You get a communication from God. So we're, it's not just that I'm imagining that I've got it, good evidence, I'm imagining that we've all got this fantastic evidence that there's something extraordinarily weird about the universe that we live in. Um, mm. And it's, I, I think with these kinds of thought experiments, it's, it's not that easy to know what the answer is, but it's a really um, out there story that to which if you ask the other question about, so what credence do you give to this happening later on tonight or tomorrow, the answer is <laughs> just going to be zero, hmm. right? It's not going to happen tonight mm. <laughs> or tomorrow. Well, I mean, uh, I accept that, of course. Mm, I would put it uh, at something like 0. 0.00000 and then a one yeah, at the You'll end run somewhere. out of breath before you're done, <laughs> before you finish listening. But, but I agree. So I sometimes say... The, the right way to think about this is that there's a quantity, we'll call it epsilon, and it's a mm. bit like the way that um, Newton and Leibniz used um, the, the fluxions in the old calculus. When you look at it from one point of view, it's zero. When you look at it from another point of view, it's just this incredibly tiny thing. And so when they were doing the way they did the calculus, they'd have these equations with all these fluxions in, and then they just cross them all out, right? And you'd get the mm. right answers at the end. Um, and so I'm thinking about your probability is like a fluxion, right? Mm -hmm, it's, mm -hmm. From a certain point of view, a practical point of view, it's zero, even if sort of theoretically it's this, you can't write it out numerically, but you call it epsilon. So right. that's what I, that's how I would think about it. I'd like to discuss uh, the subject of uh, simplicity and parsimony, some, maybe in some sense Occam's razor in theory choice, right? And choosing the right big picture, settling on the one which is most convincing, because this is central to your view, and I, I must admit that I treat it very seriously as well. So as far as I understand, uh, mm, in, well, the central postulate in, for example, Naturalism and Religion, your book, mm, is that naturalism is simpler. Right? Uh, would you be able to unpack that in sort of um, what's what the theory of naturalism is and how it compares to theism in terms of simplicity? Would you be able to unpack that? Okay, so I should probably start by saying something about simplicity um, mm -hmm. because that's not a simple topic. <laughs> um, there's we're talking about theories, and there's at least three different dimensions to the simplicity of theories that are that's relevant um, and I th what what I think is that naturalism will be simpler than theism on all three of the dimensions right so one dimension is just imagine that you axiomatize the theories and you say which one has the fewer axiom. less complicated axioms right so that will be one way and then once, if, we, if we're thinking about that, we should think that um, we can identify the theory actually with the axiomatization because everything else is entailed by the axioms. So there's a sense in which you just kind of get it for free. Whatever's bound up in the axioms is really what matters. So one thing that will be in there, so this is the second dimension, is a whole lot of undefined expressions. So this is the ideological complexity of the theory, right? The, the more primitive undefined expressions you've got, the more complicated your theory is. Mm. Right now, I'm sometimes I worry that there's a little bit of double counting here because um, the, you, you could use more axioms to maybe to define more stuff, but there's lots and lots of terms. 
that don't have complete definitions in terms of other vocabulary. In fact, going back to the point I made earlier about the analytic project, most terms turn out not to be definable, not in this strict sense where you give necessary and sufficient mm -hmm, conditions mm -hmm. for them. Uh, so, so that's the second dimension. The third dimension is the, the, the numbers and the kinds of entities that you're quantifying over. So how many, how many things do you posit of each of the kinds where you think there are mm -hmm. things of that kind? So that's not a question about ideology because we're only there, we're now only focusing on the terms where it's going to be one of your axioms that there are things of this kind. Mm. Right, so, th so that's the kind of ontological complexity of your theory. Now, sometimes people think that um, th there are other ways, that there are other dimensions to simplicity. So I'm going to, I'm going to reject that. And sometimes people think that, f say, for example, you think that um, a, a human body is a collection of cells that you only have to have commitment to the cells and you get the commitment to the body for free. Whereas I think unless you've got an explicit definition that defines a human body in terms of the cells that make it up, there's no reduction, relevant reduction there, right? Mm. So, so I'm actually thinking that you've got a lot of primitive ontological commitments that you can't do away with in a way that lots of people don't. So lots of people might think, you know, suppose the suppose at the bottom there are these simple things, simple, mm -hmm. unextended things. Um, the naturalists need only committed, be committed to those because everything else is made out of them. Whereas on the way I'm thinking about it, that's not true. You've got a bunch of other commitments because you've got to define um, terms that apply to aggregates of these things, and you have to define the you have to take the aggregates as primitives as well, right? Nobody can define cat in terms of simple, and nobody, right? You know, in terms of simples, for example. So. Uh, okay, so that's the kind of background story about simplicity. Now think about theism and naturalism. So to, to well, the, the naturalist is committed to the natural world, so is the theist. They're commi and we're going to suppose roughly that science is getting it right, so that both theists and naturalists are going to be committed to what physics, chemistry, biology, sociology, history, and so on, tell us about the world. But the theist has got some additional commitments. There's going to be God, and there's going to be properties that only God has. So there'll be mm. a bunch of ideology on this side, and then there'll be a bunch of principles that only the theist has and that the naturalist doesn't have. And there'll be nothing that the theist's got that will kind of reduce the commitments that the naturalist needs in order to give an account of the natural world. And so on all three dimensions, the theistic story will be more complicated than the mm. naturalist story, mm -hmm. and so the naturalist story is simpler. And this seems very intuitive because the theist has got God, and then there are properties that are omnipotent and omniscient mm. and perfect goodness. And then there are principles like that God is triune or um, <laughs> that, you know, or that God was incarnated and so on. And all of that stuff is, from the point of view of the naturalist, is just baggage, right? It's just excess right. of one kind or another, theoretical excess of one kind or another. So it seems kind of straightforward. And it's interesting, lots of theists just concede this point. Yes, naturalism is simpler, but there's stuff that theism can explain that naturalism can't. Whereas there are plenty of other theists who want to argue the toss and argue that theism is actually simpler. But the, the way that they do it is a bit like with the the story I was telling you before about the simples and saying, okay, once you've got the simples, you get everything else for free. And they want to say, once you've got God, you get everything else for free, <laughs> right. right? And I say, no, that's that's not right. Because what we were talking about, which, which is a better theory, and theories mm. have costs of various kinds, and you have to weigh them all up properly. You, you started uh, talking about these axioms and their, uh, their expressions in them, right? Uh, could you... Uh, Unpack that. I'm, I'm not sure what is meant by the expression. I mean, uh, express. Could you maybe explain the that? The terms. So, what I'm really thinking about is imagine that we've kind of written mm -hmm. our theories out in a kind of canonical notation, as Quine would have had us do. And so, there'll be. And, and then think about the lexicon for the language. There's going to be a bunch of predicates, 
mm-hmm. right? And they're, they're, that's where the ideology lies in the undefined predicates, mm-hmm. and the, and we can we can think of the undefined predicates as all being kind of simple ones because we can we can use um, say um, we can use various constructions to build more complicated predicates out of simpler ones, or you can think of that as a matter of explicit definition. If I've got mm-hmm. being an F and being a G, then being an F and G, right, is is a, is a obviously contained. a sort of straightforwardly defined predicate. Yeah, so it's really the kind of that's why I was talking about the undefined mm-hmm. predicates mm-hmm. in the mm-hmm. language, right, and. The theist, no less than the naturalist, thinks that there's cats and quarks and cups and computers and so on, but they think there's this other stuff, right? And right, so, right. And so they've got to have some extra ideology to describe it. Uh, there are some theists who think that there's a way of describing God on which God turns out to be kind of absolutely simple, uh, sort of ontologically, but that does nothing with this ideological problem because they still insist that God's omnipotent and triune and mm. incarnate and, and mm. abundant and, you know, or pure act or whatever, yes. all these um, predicates that naturalists find no use for. A consideration which appeared in my mind as you were talking is that, for example, when you discuss um, the cosmological argument or some sort of contingency argument with theists, uh, you focus on just comparing, and uh, so do they, um, the commitments, what they are committed to when answering this specific question, right? So they, for example, postulate there exists a necessary being. This is God, right? And you can say the same thing, right? There exists a necessary being. This is universe, right? Or it's the universe. And then nobody is on a better footing. Or no, nobody's yeah. winning here, really. It's on a par. But then I think there's a, also a different project of just checking the entities in the big picture just as a whole, not as it relates to the cosmological argument, for example, or just some um, ultimate uh, explanation of how it all came about, but just the total count of what you see in the world, right? Now, that seems to me to be conclusive, uh, the the second thing, right? So um, the total count of what a Catholic imagines, right? That includes everything that we believe in, right? Uh, as naturalists, well, m- m- my approach would be a little bit uh, more reserved, but le- I definitely do believe yeah. in everything that's natural, right? Uh, but the Catholic also believes in hell, uh, heaven, purgatory, maybe in limbo, right? And then mm, all sorts of entities like uh, angels. Should we take the second approach when deciding on what our big picture should be, what our worldview should be? So there are two separate things here. When when we're looking at the cosmological argument, what the um, the defender of the argument is typically thinking is that there's a bit of evidence that can be explained by the theist that simply can't be explained by the naturalist. And so the the point of the you know you think there's a necessarily existing God, I think that there's a necessarily existing universe, is just to point out that um, there's an explanatory par here, right? There's no explanatory advantage that the theist is getting when it comes to the sort of why is there something rather than nothing question or the, you know, where does the series of causes going back into the past terminate or where does the series of causes the sort of a is now causing b that's now causing c that where does that terminate if in, you know and so on there's no advantage right the any if if the theist has got answers to those questions the naturalist has essentially the same answers right. to them just terminating in a different kind of natural being rather than god uh, on the question about simplicity that question really should only arise when you're comparing the total theories, right? Because if you think about what you mobilise when you're trying to explain why there's something rather than nothing, the kind of incarnation and the existence of demons and so on is all irrelevant to that question, right? Mm. But nobody's really... It's not really an interesting question which view um, is, (laughs) is best restricting our attention so that supposing the only relevant 
evidence we've got is that there's something rather than nothing. You want to consider all the relevant evidence mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you want to yes. consider the total theories, right? And mm -hmm. that's why it's because of that fact that I end up saying, and so people, there's room for disagreement here. There's room for reasonable disagreement because it's such a complicated judgment. I don't think the simplicity question is all that difficult myself, but I do think that the, there's so many different things that people think are relevant to the question whether God exists. Um, there are hundreds of different kinds of arguments appealing to hundred, you know, hundreds of different bits of information. And it's hard to have an overview of all of that at once. And so that mm. leaves room for people to think, you know, the stuff about mathematics really bothers me. I, I can't believe in abstract objects, but, you know, if numbers were just these things in the mind of God, that would make me happy. <laughs> and, then, and then, of course, there's an argument to be had about that, and, and naturalists will have something to say in response. But there's all these different judgments. Mm, right? Right. So, but anyway, that's not really relevant to the point you were making at the moment, but that's... No, no, that, that's important. That's one of the kind of upshots of insisting that you think about the total evidence in the big picture. Right. Some theists, this often com comes up in the conversation about the contingency argument and so on, but you can hear um, sentences like, um, you shouldn't count the consequences of a theory as a cost to its simplicity. So, for example, you know, Josh Rasmussen will say that there's a perfect foundation or a perfect being, let's yeah. say, Mm, and then the fact that the natural world exists is sort of a consequence of that, of the first postulate, the postulate that there exists a perfect being, and that we sort of shouldn't, it, it wouldn't be a good idea to, to make him count all of the natural objects. So what I want to say to that is, it's not a logical consequence, okay? Let me grant you, God exists. Now you derive that there are quarks. <laughs> any new assumptions whatsoever, right? It's right, just right. not true, right? You you have to have a theory that's sufficient to generate um, explanations for everything that needs explanation. And mm -hmm. um, a perfect being exists is not enough to get you yes. quarks and cats and Australia and so on. Yeah, that right? makes perfect sense. So that's my response. And he thinks that th there's a sense in which everything depends on God, right? This is a, I mean, theists are kind of committed to this. Everything is a, is a downstream consequence of God's um, creative decision. And it was kind of bound up in that original decision that we would get all this stuff, um, you know, this stuff about um, chances that has to be maybe factored into that. But equally, the naturalist thinks that everything is there in the, in the initial state, given the laws in the initial state, forgetting about the chances, everything's a logical consequence, right? He's just leaving out part of his description that, you know, God wants there to be quarks mm. and yes. Australia and so on. You have to build but once on you the write all of, but once you But you have to write all that stuff in by hand. It's not a logical consequence, right? That's essentially my reply. To, hmm. to Josh's claim. And he thinks that it's very important that his fundamental entity is incredibly simple. But that's, I mean, there are two things to say to that. One is that it's not all that matters. And the other thing is we don't know much at all about the naturalist fundamental entity. We don't know what properties it has. Science doesn't really hasn't pulled aside the curtain that takes hmm. us back before the inflation, inflationary period. There's just no agreement about what's back there. So we don't really know whether it's going to turn out, what it's going to turn out to be like. Right, right. Uh, now, he might think it couldn't possibly be simpler than his perfect being. Uh, I'd like to, before I comment on that one, I want to know what, what the theory is, and we aren't close to having it yet. Mm, right, right. I mean, he could be right about that, right? Because the other point's also important. That's not his total theory. His total theory isn't just there's a perfect being and now logical consequence we get all the other... That's just <laughs> not true. Right, right. Okay, so I would like to focus now on uh, two mm, different theistic mm, philosophers, uh, and that's Richard Swinburne and Trent Doherty. So mm, Swinburne has famously said that mm, his god, 
mm, is simple because, mm, well, or his view of reality even. Mm, not sure he, how he cashes it, cashes it out precisely, but the view is that there's just one, one entity at the beginning, and uh, that's God with just three mm, traits or properties, and that's uh, knowledge, mm, power, and freedom of will with no constraints. And it sort of always seemed to me that this is mm, a bit of a cheat. Like, mm, the way my thinking mm, goes is that mm, if a person can do one thing, right, that's simpler than if, if he can do... Uh, a thousand things we get an even more complex person who can get could do you know ten thousand things and then when you get to infinity of things that's supposed to be simpler right there's a sort of um, what's your view on that sort of thing so it seems even harder in the case of knowledge because supposing that someone knows all the truths tells you nothing about what they know unless you know what the truths are so it seems like You've got, to, you've got to have all of them in there as well in order for this to be an informative story, right? The, having, having unlimited knowledge on its own um, is, is empty if there's nothing to know. And if there's lots of stuff to know, then presumably that's all written into the theory. On the being able to do things... Um, there, there are interesting questions. I mean, sorry, I'm going to, we're going to get sidetracked if we go down this path. <laughs> you know, um, like the paradox of the stone, for example. Mm -hmm, I can mm -hmm. go down to the gym and make something that's too heavy for me to lift. So there's right. something that it's possible for somebody to do. Can his omnipotent being do that? Well, presumably not, mm. right? So um, isn't that a limitation? Well, it is in a sense, right? It's a limitation on the range of the tasks, that can be performed because there's something I can do that the omnipotent, the allegedly omnipotent right. being can't do, right? I mean, there's thousands of quibbles, but we probably we probably don't want to go mm. into those weeds. It's uh, interesting and relevant in the sense that, for example, some people who favor the sort of Bayesian approach, like Jeffrey J. Lauder or maybe Paul Draper, they want to count the internal consistency into the prior probability, right? So this is also the domain in which simplicity is considered, and now. If Swinburne presents something like this, there's this power with no constraints, then mm, we can sort of allege that maybe there's some inconsistency in that theory, and uh, maybe this is a reason why it shouldn't be pre preferred mm, over naturalism. Am I getting this right? And maybe right. also so I'd like to ask, before you comment on that, mm, do you think that this is a good approach to count consistency uh, into the prior probability, and, or maybe should we just weed out the inconsistent theories and then just compare the consistent ones? I can answer both of those questions <laughs> okay. in the one go. So I think that there, there's a kind of three-step process here. The first thing is you develop the theories. The second thing is you check to see whether they're consistent, and you only proceed to the third stage of evaluating um, simplicity versus um, explanatory power for the consistent theories. And so this is where arguments might actually be useful, derivations, because you might be able to show that somebody's candidate best theory is inconsistent, in which case they'll have to do some tinkering and come back with a new best theory. It probably won't be very different from the one they had before, um, though it might be. It depends kind of how bad the inconsistency is. But if you've got a very complicated theory, it's quite likely that there'll be some inconsistencies in there somewhere. And we're only human after all. But, right. right. But, you know, you can, yeah. So so that was my answer. And that I think that answers both of the questions that you mm. were asking. I'm not a Bayesian when it comes to these questions. So I keep going back and talking about the theoretical Virtue. virtues. That's because I think that the domain of the theories is too big because it includes things like your modal views, for example. Mm. And um, we, it, it feels to me like you can't have a probability space that's going to give um, kind of meaningful probabilities to claims that in one view are said to be impossible and in the mm. other view are said to be true. Right. Right. So so I'm skeptical. I like 
Bayesian statistics, the kind of minimum message length, is very closely related to that. You know, we're trying to um, to minimise commitments and maximise explanatory power. But I just don't think that the Bayesian framework is the best one for spelling that out when mm -hmm, we get mm -hmm. to the kind of big picture stories. Right. But that's I'm I'm not going to die in a ditch over that. I could be <laughs> wrong about that, maybe. Mm -hmm. But then in that case, my answer would be no. The consistency thing is not part of the prior. That's just a separate thing. We are now on consistency, and um, sometimes when you comment on which arguments are successful, you uh, state that you're like the reductio ad absurdum arguments, which yeah. attempt to establish some internal difficulty or just contradiction, outright contradiction. Now, I thought that maybe you'll be interested in discussing the evolutionary, evolutionary argument against naturalism. It sort of proceeds along those lines. It attempts to establish some conflict within the view of the naturalist. Maybe let me just quickly present the argument as I understand yeah, sure. it, and then uh, I'll ask you for, for a response to it. So... First of all, let me tell you what the argument does not claim. It does not attempt to establish that the theory of evolution is false. Uh, it does not establish to, that, there, that there is a contradiction between naturalism and evolution, that these sort of exclude one another. Uh, but rather, as Plantinga says, that one cannot sensibly accept them both, naturalism and evolution. And the central premise is that uh, the species Homo sapien, as, as we believe, uh, I think, uh, has come about through the same process as any other animal. My hand is just the same, uh, is a product of natural, natural selection working on random mutations, just as my mind is and my cognitive faculties. Uh, by cognitive faculties, uh, I mean, mm, plantinga means something like memory, perception, deduction, induction, and so on. Mm, I think I agree with that. Uh, and then the idea is that if this all evolved, if this all, all of this is a product of evolution, that we shouldn't think that that's reliable. The next step that Plantinga makes is that really what evolution selects for um, is uh, adaptive behavior and not so much the truth of beliefs, right? So um, it's relevant for an organism to find food, to survive, to reproduce, um, uh, but it isn't, isn't relevant for, I mean, as far as evolution is concerned, Mm, that the organism has true beliefs, right? And mm, as Plantinga claims, uh, we cannot even uh, talk about reliable uh, belief-forming sort of processes in, you know, or structures in our brains. Mm, and uh, here they typically come up with some fanciful example. <laughs> like I found one uh, animation, I think it's approved by uh, Plantinga, uh, where the, imagine that you are in a forest and you come across a, a bear and then mm, they say, uh, you're truly believing that poking a bear will get you mauled, or you're falsely believing that poking a bear will get you abducted by aliens, lead to the same kind of actions and will help you live to see another day. Right? And then mm, Plantinga says that if, if we recognize that the probability of our cognitive faculties being re reliable is low, uh, if we suppose that naturalism and evolution is true, right, then we have a defeater for all of our mm, all of our convictions, and that includes the conviction that naturalism and evolution are true. So that that's there's a sort of self defeating aspect to that. And mm, then Plantinga presents this in a few different versions, and you refer specifically to the one that where where he says that mm, well, one version is that our cognitive faculties aren't reliable just in general, and the other one is with, with respect to our conclusions on subjects of metaphysics, right, and philosophical subjects. We really, really shouldn't think that we are um, tracking the truth in metaphysical uh, um, issues. Uh, yeah, so maybe uh, if I could ask you to, to comment on that, how do you approach this argument? Yeah. We'll start with the, the more specific argument. So planting it thinks that it's going to be self-defeating for um, somebody who accepts both evolutionary theory and naturalism. So for now on, I'm just going to say naturalism. To keep mm -hmm. it. It's going to be self-defeating for somebody to accept naturalism and yet suppose that we're not reliable when it comes to forming metaphysical beliefs. Like thinking that the belief in naturalism is a metaphysical 
belief that there's something there's, there's going to be something wrong with doing that. And so the, my first thought is, okay, so um, think about our reliability with respect to metaphysics. It's abysmal, right? <laughs> Let's just do a check about the range of disagreement on metaphysical matters right, in philosophy. Um, I mean, in fact, it's not just metaphysics, it's philosophy mm -hmm. as a whole. It's obvious, since planting is thinking about reliability in terms of truth tracking, if you pick any two philosophers, they disagree about a thousand things. They can't be both tracking the truth. You consider philosophers collectively, that just multiplies that problem sort of a few thousand fold, or <laughs> you know, how many philosophers there are, right. right? Philosophers don't track the truth. They're not reliable in this sense, right? So the probability that we're reliable with respect to metaphysical beliefs is very low. Right now, now let's think about. So, what probability are you going to give to we're reliable given your theory, right? Um, whatever your theory is, the probability of reliability we know is very low. So, in order for it to be high, that the probability of reliability given your theory, probability in your theory has got to be very low. So right. now let's just apply that to planting it, right? What's the probability <laughs> that we're reliable given theism? Next to, right? Next to zero. If it's self-defeating for naturalists, it's self-defeating for theists as well. Right. So, so planting is just hoist by his own petard. That's the way I see it. So that's, that's essentially my response to right, the right. overall argument. There's something wrong with the argument. Mm. Right. There's another important thing to say, though, which is that if you th consider our beliefs, broadly speaking, there's no reason why, um, just because you believe in evolution and naturalism, you can't think that we're, broadly speaking, reliable. What matters is how much you think we speak about certain kinds of things, right? If we're always talking about philosophy and religion and politics, then we're not reliable. But if we're thinking about our abilities, our kind of everyday perceptual abilities, our memory abilities and so on, we're going to reach a pretty decent standard of reliability. I'm pretty good with being able to identify the cutlery and the crockery and the fine things on my computer and so on. And if that's all the stuff that we're taking into account, then we're reliable. But our reliability with respect to those things is no mystery given um, naturalism because part of what is required for sort of prospering, if, if you're mm -hmm, thinking about mm -hmm. that in evolutionary terms, is getting it right, knowing when there's predators that are out there that are threats to you and that now's the time to run away versus there are no predators around and I'm safe to stay here grazing. And you would expect over time that organisms are going to be pretty good at identifying, you know, at knowing stuff about the environments that they're in, which just means that their beliefs are you know, going to be true. Mm, right? right. So I think that planting is also mistaken there. And the kind of example that you gave is um, um, kind of instructive. I think, because uh, it's uh, the, the way that planting is thinking about it, you just have this one belief and that determines your behaviour, right? Um, poking bears is, you know, going to lead to abduction by aliens, so I'm not going to poke bears. But, I mean, that's what that reminds me of is the kind of very old-style logical behaviourism where there's this very tight connection between inputs and outputs, right? Um, you know, I see a bear um, if I poke it, right? Whereas, in fact, all of your behaviour, and this is true for quite simple organisms, is complicated. There's, you've got a sense, so long as you've got a central processor, you're doing this time allocation thing. Right now, I'm eating, so I'm, you know, I'm not looking for a mate. Or right now, I'm running away from a predator, so I'm not going to try and grab some food on the way past because, <laughs> you know... And, and so on. And so we just don't have those single trigger dispositions. What he's doing, I think, in in the book, that the book that I'm talking about, where the conflict really lies, where the conflict really lies, is he's treating animals in just the same kind of way with just the same kind of error that logical behaviorists made about people. Right? Mm. That's what I really think is going on.
Mm. Um, and that, and if he wasn't making that mistake, he'd be much more, he'd have a much more, I think, sensible view about the reliability of our faculties, given evolution and naturalism. You would expect that they're going to be pretty good in some domains, but we do expect them to be, I mean, this is partly sort of a posteriori. We know that they're just not reliable when it comes to other domains, and that's mm. fine. Even where we're good, like with perception, we rely on our perception, you know, vision. We'll go with vision. We rely on our vision when the conditions are good and we're feeling good. We haven't had too many drinks. It's not foggy and so on. But otherwise, part of what we learn is not, oh, we trust our our, our vision, come what may, our visual judgments. It's, <laughs> we learn which conditions to trust them and which ones not. And the same with testimony, which is a big source. We learn who to trust and who not and on what topics and so on. Mm. And a lot of our time is, a lot of our education is about calibrating so that we are able to get good information out mm. of the various resources that we've got. It's not, I just trust my eyes and I trust my ears. That's that's not accurate as a description <laughs> of how we function. Right, right. Well, uh, to yeah. some level, uh, Plantinga, for example, when he speaks of uh, reliability, he f s uh, sort of admits that um, there's a range of rel reliability. It's not uh, that like we perceive reality uh, directly. Uh, some of our beliefs will be false. Uh, but then, but then, well, yeah, maybe let's skip that for a second and then get back to the um, issue of the metaphysical beliefs. So. Mm, this strikes me as correct. I uh, sort of take a look at the philosophical literature and it strikes me that there is little agreement. There's always somebody who denies it. any thesis you might come up with, even when it comes to the laws of logic, right? Some, some people uh, maintain that there may, might be uh, true contradictions and so on. But mm, saying that, that our... Mm, abilities to track the truth in philosophy is uh, well in one podcast you literally say that it's rubbish right <laughs> uh, uh, it might have some pretty um, uh, well it, it might have some uh, grim consequences for us i mean because we we sort of and for example you do philosophy right for a living and uh, sort of is it your assessment of yourself that you you sort of do something which is going to lead you nowhere? So I also have unorthodox views about philosophy. So maybe I should say something about this next. So although it turns out, I mean, they, these are not original ideas. It's just that they're they're not widely shared. So I think of the disciplines as having typically having a core where there's just expert agreement on not only the answers to the questions, but the methods that you use. And then around that, there's a kind of, I don't know, the next ring out, I don't know, a corona or something, I don't know what I'll call it, where there is an agreement on the answers to the questions, but there's agreement on the methods to be used. We kind of know how eventually we're going to find out where the truth lies and the experts agree on that and then as you move a bit further out you start getting into this domain where there's no agreement about um, the answers to questions there's no agreement about the methods and we're not even sure whether we're in that domain anymore or not uh, and I think of that as the philosophy of the given domain so philosophy of physics is just asking those questions sort of on the boundary of physics where we don't know the answers to the questions but we also don't even know what methods would enable us to answer them so if you think about string theory right we don't currently know whether it can be tested or not um, so amongst working physicists there's actually this dispute about whether they should really call it physics Mm -hmm. Right, right. Or, 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 or not. Now, philosophers might take a different view. They might think that it's clearly physics, but they'll still agree. Uh, they'll, they'll, there'll still be this huge disagreement on whether it's true, um, you know, how, how we could know whether it's true or not, and so on. Okay, now, so that, that gives you all the domains. There are that once were philosophy but aren't anymore because we figured out how to become experts in answering some of the questions, or at least, you know, there's science got up and going. And so there are people can make themselves experts in these domains. Hmm. There are other areas in where 
we have made very little progress. And so the normative is one area where <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot less agreement on, on on normative questions. But, you know, anyway, so so anyway, that's that's philosophy. Mm-hmm. Success for a philosopher would be to turn something that's currently philosophy into something else, as, for example, mm, right, right. formal logicians did in the, I guess, really in the 20s and 30s. Psychologists kind of managed it um, maybe a little bit earlier than that. Physicists managed it in the kind of, you know, the, the period around Galileo, chemists another 100 mm. years after that, and so on, right? And there's, I mean, it would be nice if one day some philosophers could figure out the normative <laughs> But maybe that's just never going to happen, mm. right? It's possible that some things will just stay resolutely philosophical forever. But you can see now where there's a, where, one way in which there's a contribution that philosophers can make. You want some people working on these questions all the time, these right, boundary right. questions. Um, and it sometimes it pays off in right, right. big yeah. ways. You know, the that theory, makes sense. Well, the theory, you know, computers um, have their origins in philosophical Speculation, you know, Turing's work in the 30s, even though maybe even in the early 30s he already had in mind the possibility of building a computer, but the theory came first and it was philosophical when he developed it and so on. Mm -hmm. So I'm not a pessimist about philosophy at all. In fact, I think philosophy has a spectacular track record of success Mm, because physics, chemistry and so on. Mm. Right, right. Um, But but for any individual... The likelihood that you're going to be one of the people who makes one of those amazing breakthroughs is probably pretty small, but you want some people to do it. So that's one side. The other side, I guess, is that I don't see anything wrong with continuing the conversations about you know, religion, politics, and so on, partly just because they're important practical questions. And there might be things that philosophers will say that people who are apologists or engaged in, you know, practical politics will miss, mm. right? So, so there, there may be a contribution there, even if it's not the right. kind of establishing a completely new discipline. Yeah, so I also wanted to discuss this from the perspective of our current beliefs. So one might say that uh, well, we are not really truth trackers when it comes to metaphysical beliefs, but now I sit sit here and I find myself with a bunch of them. Well, in fact, a lot, quite a lot of them. If we count, for example, we were discussing the devas and ghosts and demons. I think I have a pretty high confidence that they are non-existent entities, right? Uh, but there are there's a range of beliefs where my of the metaphysical sort where my con- confidence is uh, is just uh, low or somewhere around 50%, like I cannot decide between the negation and the affirmation. But with respect to those where I have a high degree of certainty, for example, I think uh, the Christian hell, like I, I, I don't find the slightest shred of fear in myself, right? Yeah. That I am going to end up in one of those realms, right? Uh, being tortured forever and so on. Uh, that's a metaphysical belief. And Plantinga might just appear and say to me, didn't you just say that this is completely unreliable, right? And uh, what what am I to say then? That, that yeah, that, yeah, Alvin, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I'll, I give that give up that conclusion. Should I, I mean, what, what should, should be the right approach here? So like you, I, that's not a thought that causes me to lose sleep. Mm. And I really just don't believe it, right? With a very strong credence. Um, and so it's an interesting question. I mean, what, one one thought is that you could, I mean, and this is something that I talked about a little bit in the Naturalism and Religion book, is that you can think about the paradox of the preface at this point. You know, you write a book and each claim that's in the book you think is very likely to be true, but their conjunction you think is certainly false. <laughs> right. right, and um, and so depending where you set the bar for reliability, and depending where you've got your credences, it might well be reasonable for you to think that you're both unreliable and yet you believe all of these things, and there's no inconsistency between those two attitudes. 
You can't do it if you're a kind of dogmatist and you give credence one to all of your metaphysical beliefs. <laughs> but nobody that I know in philosophy does that. Right. right? And often enough, when we when we, we, we have these positions that we defend in the literature. And if you really ask us to give a credence, it'll be hardly above 0.5. It's just that that's the, you know, we staked out this one. This was the bit of logical space that, right. that we identified because we discussed it first. And so we've gone on defending it just to see what mileage you can get. So I'm reminded of some, one, one of my mentors, John Bigelow at Monash, um, he spent a couple of years, he was a four-dimensionalist, and he spent a couple of years just trying to pretend to be a presentist to see <laughs> um, what it was like. And then he ended up being a presentist, but I'm not sure um, that, <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm not sure if you ask him what the credences that he gives are, what, what he would say. I may, you know. And I guess kind of the more you reply to objections and so on, maybe it feels like your credences go up. But, you know, if a phil philosophical oracle mm. appeared on Earth and went round and, and we all just knew they were the oracle somehow, and mm. they started resolving all of the debates, no, I'm sorry, mind-brain identity is true, presentism is true, mm -hmm. consequentialism is true and so on. Right. Um, I wouldn't feel kind of devastated finding mm -hmm. out that I'd had all these false beliefs, right? Right, right. I'm not just, I'm just not that wedded to them. Uh, the, I, I mean, I guess it's kind of weird because with the, I just don't think there's any chance that um, on the God question that it's going to play out that way. Whereas, mm. so maybe it's not a kind of typical philosophical belief in the way that the other things that I mentioned mm. are. I'm not right. sure about that. Let's get back to the most most basic examples of where Plantinga is alleging that our reliability might be mm, very low. So the examples with the frog on the lily pad and the antelope and so on. I mean, there it strikes me like we really owe them mm, an explanation. And some of them you've already explained, but mm, we, re we really owe them some explanation as to how it is, uh, how it is that natural selection, how that would give us some degree of truth tracking, right? Mm, somebody might say, because as, as I understand, your claim is that mm, for those, uh, for example, let's take the frog, right? And uh, it evolved in that specific environment. And that's why it's able to, with some degree of, of reliability, uh, yeah. track what's around it, uh, you know, recognize when the, the fly is whizzing by and, uh, and then catch it, right? Uh, or find a mate and so on, so recognize the, the different body and maybe not consume itself, right? So he, it has to have some recognition of its own body. Mm, am I getting this, this right? So I think that's right. And it's true that the frog's not very sophisticated, so you can fool it. You can f fire BBs past it and it will flick out its tongue at them. <laughs> but, but that doesn't mean that in normal conditions sort of for the frog, standard circumstances, its beliefs are not truth-tracking because typically when there's a small dark thing whizzing by, it's food mm. right, in, its, in its normal environment. Especially, I mean, the, the BB thing's a bit odd because it doesn't sort of flutter around the way that a, a fly mm. would, but I guess it's because it's just moving fast enough and the frog's very quick to mm. try to capture it. There's a problem about whether the frog has beliefs, but it has, it seems to me it has kind of true representational states. Right, And right. that's what you'd expect for evolution to give it. And our situation's quite, di in, some, in one way, is pretty different from the frog because the frog's central processing is pretty limited, whereas ours is quite extensive. And that has to do with what happened when we became social right. creatures and there's all this processing for facial recognition and things like mm. that. But also, um, you know, just being, being, being social creatures that lead very complicated lives mm. just requires a central processor. And then that central processor could be put to other purposes. That was what happened eventually. And it's got built into it some logic and some probability theory and things right. like that, um, some elementary stuff, which were it not built in there, would have made, you know, the creatures that we were uncompetitive with the ones who did have it right. when it came to 
things like finding a mate and surviving, yes. negotiating the more complicated social world that we were gradually building for ourselves. So when it comes to us being social creatures, it seems to me that as soon as we develop language, right, and then it turns out to be a huge advantage for us to sort of make represent the worlds to each other in terms of propositions, then the truth actually does start to matter, right? Because somebody could lie and then gain an advantage or mm, trick you and so on. And then it, it actually, well, maybe there is some selection in that sense. I mean, I mean, some of it has to be learned too. So there's a, mm -hmm. how much of it is evol is biological evolution versus social evolution. But in each person, you learn, I said this before, who, who you can trust, which people you can trust to tell you the truth right. in a range of domains. So you learn who are the experts, but you also learn who are the confidence tricksters and so on. Right. And this is just an ongoing battle. Because we're social creatures and um, we kind of like hierarchy, um, and nobody wants to be at the bottom. You use this uh, this phrase that the organisms evolved to um, for their cognitive faculties to represent their local environment, right? Uh, and I'm wondering if I'm in a environment to which I fit, right? Because we, when we were on the savanna, right, when the Homo sapiens yeah. uh, evolved, the environment environment looked completely different like everything i see around me is artificial in some sense right and one may have the thought that maybe i'm not tracking this correctly right maybe i'm not reliable but then it seems to me there's something more fundamental like just basic reliability of the signals from my eyes and basic calculations of what yes. i think are going to be the results of something falling right or maybe even I, I find the examples with the bear, right, that there's going to be an alien abduction. I mean, there are irrational thoughts in the human mind. Of course, that's, yeah. that's correct, right? So to some extent, he's right in the sense that uh, we do <laughs> some to, some, some, sometimes go wrong. Things like folk physics can often be mistaken. There are these nice experiments. Uh, this, this physicist had a lab and he had a little trolley with a... Um, that he could put a participant in, and they would carry something heavy, like a little brick. Mm -hmm. and there was a ring mm -hmm. in the middle beside the track, and the trolley would go past, and their job was to let go of the brick so that it fell inside the ring. And so this was an experiment that was done with um, undergraduate students in the United States. Mm -hmm. And a very large proportion, more than half of them, waited till they got past the ring before they let go of the brick. It was quite surprising to the experimenters. But it has to do with, if you've ever been in a train and you throw something out of the window, it looks like it goes whoosh, backwards. <laughs> right. right. So, so that, anyway, that was the kind of hypothesis mm. that they came up with to explain the data. But we're not, sort of intuitive physics is not great. Mm. Right. right. But, um, but strangely enough, that was not a task that, you know, our ancestors had to, Right, <laughs> participate in right. yeah. But they, they, I mean, they might have done it for fun, but they certainly their lives didn't depend upon it. So you have to look at the what really matters. There's, you know, you and and you would expect that you're going to be pretty good at um, picking out agents, though you might err on the side of making mistakes, seeing agents where there aren't any, aren't any to go back to another right. topic that's relevant to philosophy of religion, the code of mm. cognitive science of religion. Um, if you're going to make mistakes, it's not going to be mistakes of the, um, you hope, the, I don't think there's anything there, but there is. It's going to be the other way because, yes, you waste a bit of energy, but you live to fight another day mm, right, as right. long as you run away every time you should. <laughs> yeah, so maybe there's some, like, intergenerational that over generations uh, over the generations uh, some sort of knowledge is collected uh, and then spread around our mm, like global hu human community and then we can adjust our expectations in accord in accordance with that right maybe there's some social evolution in, in some sense right yes and that's part of what makes this so hard is our social history is very long now hundreds of thousands, millions of years, uh, and we pass stuff from one generation to the next. So it's not just um, 
it's not just that we're <laughs> there's a history of biological evolution and somehow magically it's equipped us to survive in the world that we're in now that's that's not a picture that even in Darwin's time, Darwin himself wouldn't have thought that that was a plausible picture about him. Because I forget, I haven't read the. I mean, he did have some. He did write stuff about human evolution, but it certainly wouldn't have been. Um, it, w it wouldn't have ignored the social aspect. I think that comes to mind is our reliability when it comes to driving cars. We really aren't fit to that environment, <laughs> and hence the deaths. Uh, which follow. <laughs> so, so I was going to do the same example. The, our ability to tell how fast we're going, mm. once you get up, up to sort of 70 or 80 kilometres an hour, we're not that good at judging how fast we're going, but that's not surprising because we didn't travel at this speed at any, except in very unfortunate cases, except in the last 40 or 50 years. Right, right. That's right. <laughs> okay, and that's everything I wanted to ask you about, uh, Professor Oppie. Uh, thank you for that. That was amazing. Uh, it's really informative for me, and uh, I get a chance to, to, you know, to learn from you. So thank you. Um, if you live in Poland, you can buy uh, Professor Oppie's books on uh, Amazon.com. Uh, for example, you can get them instantly through the Kindle versions. But uh, yeah, uh, I would recommend using Amazon DE or Amazon.co.uk uh, for for the uh, you know paperback and so on. Where can listeners find more of your stuff? Where where, where do you think think they should go to get uh, some um, better view of your ideas? So you mentioned. Um, one of my well, you've mentioned two of my books. I'll plug another one. The one I like is the one I wrote most recently called Atheism: The Basics, oh. um, which is a kind of nice, friendly introduction to atheism. Mm. And I've got a new book that will be out. I don't know quite know when. I thought it was finished. It's not clear that it is. So I'm doing. It's a joint book with Kenny Pierce from. Mm -hmm. um, it's a it's a debate about the existence of God. Great. Um, and that that might be interesting as well. I haven't seen those, so uh, I'll make sure to look into those. So for now, thank you very much for this interview uh, and hopefully uh, see you next time. <laughs> thank you. So thanks, thanks for inviting me. Bye.